There's a revelatory feel to a lot of the religious enthusiasm about the railroad. We don't see that in the textbook recitations about the power of the railroad in religious millennialism, where California, I mean, we know the tropes about California as Eden. The railroad's important to that because they put out image after image after image after image once they've got four color lithography and really good photography. The beauty, you know, think orange crate labels, that kind of pastel, gorgeous imagery of California, that's Edenic. But it's not simply the imagery. There are many a person in that era who believe it. They're not quite going back in kind of uh, biblical exegesis and saying California is Eden. In other words, we found it. Although there is a fair, there is some of that in the American West. If you peel back certain layers of LDS thinking, etc., there is some of that. But the vision that this will bring about the second coming is an argument opposed to the railroad opposition crowd. This is, this is really enthusiastic embrace of the railroad. All right. Let's take it a little bit for, further into the race and immigration issue. We have a pet, a pet race and immigration story in California history, which is the Chinese and the railroad work. And by pet, I mean usual kind of recitation of the Chinese laborers. I support that. It's a brilliant opportunity to do a case study about the Chinese integration or lack thereof into the society by way of labor. That said, there's also twists and turns here that you need to, we, there's an opportunity to get your students to look at it this way. And by that I mean, even in the fourth grade curriculum, but certainly in eighth, and most likely in 11th, I'm not as familiar with the 11th, the vision that the California congressional delegation and particular elites led the charge against the Chinese presence in America is in there, and it's correct. The Chinese, if you think about the immigrant and racial stories of 19th century America, which if you're of an optimistic frame of mind, is essentially the rights and privileges of American citizenship are a concentric circle that widened slowly to draw in other groups, culminating in uh, women's suffrage and the basically same time birthright citizenship of Native Americans. Okay? So, if you think that's a gradual concentric inclusion of differing groups, others, well, you can do that. You can sustain that by virtue of reference to the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, the rising women's suffrage movement, et cetera. The Chinese don't fit. They're there, there's no room for them in that. You leave. You can't stay here. Well, you have to put that in dialogue with the larger issues of American history in that way. And California is your perfect case study. Not only do you have to leave, but within blocks of here, really, we're going to cut your pigtails off. We're going to kill you. We're going to push you into feminized labor niches, think laundries, restaurants, et cetera, in part because we're still trying to wrestle with uh, gender dynamics in the city. But we're going to push you into these places where you don't compete with white labor. And we're going to pit immigrant groups against another. The Irish versus the Chinese is perfectly correct. So there is that story, which is powerful and important and fundamentally tied to the railroad. Because the railroad is saying to the Chinese, uh, labor delegations or labor uh, foremen and companies circa 1864, 65, 66, more, more, more. They send boats to go get them. Well, here's your wrinkle. If you teach California history to kids and you raise the issue, the sort of chestnut issue of the railroad had more power than government, more power than any other entity on the landscape. The railroad could do whatever it wanted. How come the Chinese are excluded? How come they lose that one? You could say the railroad's already been built. They didn't need that much labor. That's not necessarily true. Southern Pacific's expanding its railroad imprint by buying up other railroads. And there's always capital work to be done on a railroad, always. They pretty much wanted the Chinese to stay. Tractable, labor supply, cheap, you know, supposedly um, deferential, et cetera. They wanted them. They lose. Why? 
You can have students wrestle with that. That's a great DBQ thing. Look at the Chinese exclusion documentation. Have your students inhabit the mind, body, and spirit of Collis Huntington or Leland Stanford. Write a letter opposing it. Why would you oppose it? And how come you didn't win? So funneling that through railroad history makes perfect sense. It's a chestnut of immigration history in California, but it's lively, and it raises all kinds of issues about what society, who, who gets to play, who gets to be here, and why. And then, of course, if you wanted to take it forward, either across the grade levels or across the time of your curriculum, your year, what happens to Chinese immigration and relationships to the uh, Chinese nation state circa early 20th century progressive anti-Asian um, activities and particularly the Second World War when the alliance with China on the part of the United States is a diplomatic alliance opposed to Japan. So it gives you all kinds of opportunities to do that. All right. Um, if you take things into you know, the, the relationship between the race, immigration, environmental landscape, and the political landscape are fundamental. They are, in many respects, the same theme, just from different vantages. If you take it towards the latter 19th century, the opportunity to discuss the excesses of the Gilded Age and the rising discontent with that across farming and industrial labor force collectives, think populism, California is a beautiful case study of that. Because you've got the big four building gazillion dollar mansions on basically a kite scheme accounting process where they can just build against borrowed money and no one ever really checks the books until the end of the 19th century and by then it's way too late. So the rising discontent against you know, the textbook placeholder plutocracy, the plutocrats, that's a California story every bit as much as it's a Tammany Hall story, if not more so. And it's built upon the foundations of the railroad, no question whatsoever. So even within case study opportunities in California, you can do the Pullman strike. I've written on the Pullman strike uh, years ago about this issue, and it's really fascinating. Um, I mean, not what I wrote, but the, the, the <laughs> Pullman strike. The Pullman strike shuts down rail traffic in California. In California, It's a strike against the manufacturing plant of the Pullman Palace cars outside of Chicago. But the labor alliances here in California take everyone by surprise. Rail traffic shut down. The depots are inhabited in the summer of 1894 by striking railroad workers who are supplied food, uh, cattle, um, recreation, et cetera, by farmers who come in and say, we're on the same side. We both hate the railroad. The railroad's an abomination. We're on the same side. Well, there's your farmer industrial labor alliance that scares everyone to death. That's it. And then National Guardsmen are sent against them to break it up. And the National Guardsmen in June of 1894 give their guns to the strikers because they're National Guardsmen. They went to high school with the strikers. They're, they did the, the California militia National Guard learns a very important story uh, uh, lesson there. If you're going to send National Guard against citizen strikers of some sort, don't bring them from the same town. <laughs> send the LA guys against the Sacramento guys. Send the San Francisco guys against the Valley guys. Don't have any alliances of kin. But they don't know that. They send them in. Strikers hand their guns to the, uh, the uh, National Guardsmen hand their guns to the striker. And then you've got the opportunity for 1848 kind of barricade revolution until the federal government comes in with the injunction about the males and they break it with federal troops who aren't going to mess around. That's a great case study about the railroad's place in California. Mrs. Stanford writes to the strikers, and she said, you all loved my late husband. And the strikers kind of say, well, not really. You know? She said, can I just get through? Can I go from here to there? And they do it, because they recognize the PR power in it. They're really smart. They festoon her, her um, locomotive with flowers. They put the name of the striking union on her train, and they sail it right through the strike, the barricades. <laughs> Wonderful opportunity for this. OK, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish up here in a second. Take the railroad issue up through the 20th, early 20th century. 
By then, railroads are a known commodity on the landscape. They've been around for a long time. It's hard to find somebody in 1910 who's never ridden one, although there will be some. They, they know them. They've seen them. They're embedded into the landscape and the rhythms, and they're starting their further, um, uh, further reverberations on the ways in which towns and landscapes are oriented. This is back to our kind of our environmental feature. In other words, your kids are going to know this, that America rises up both by uh, rural attachment and attachment to either coastlines or riparian landscape, riparian waterways. You move people around, you move stuff around by uh, proximity to water. The railroads begin to reorient that. Fundamentally, towns start to turn towards the railroad as opposed to the river, even though the railroad's oftentimes right next to the river because it's flat. But there's a reorientation there that's, that's powerful for students. If you get to the progressive era, even in the collegiate environments, what I do with students in the progressive era is you know, I start off in a kind of provocative, seemingly nonsensical uh, point where I say to them, we're going to do the progressive era today and tomorrow and then you know, Friday or whatever. Um, uh, your watchword is hygiene. Progressives are obsessed with hygiene. Everything's got to be cleaned up. Clean the water. Clean the politics up, clean the sewers, clean the bloodstreams, clean the pathogens out, straighten the, st straighten the streets, pave them. Progressives love concrete. Let's get a lot of concrete on the landscape. And that vision of cleanliness, which is an obsessive vision that mixes race, immigration, politics, and environment in a beautiful, obsessive, compulsive way that breaches that on the one hand can be deeply humanitarian and at the very same time can be profoundly eugenic. Of course they're going to go after the railroads. So they go after the railroads in every expression. The political expression, graft, corruption, they get rid of railroad passes. If I'm a railroad executive in uh, 1893 and I'm speaking to you all and you, I have some patronage relationship with you all, when I finish my talk, I'm going to go table to table and I'm going to hand you out railroad passes. You can ride the railroad for free. Thanks for coming. Don't forget us. That's a powerful inducement to political friendship. They're going to get rid of that. Can't do that anymore. That's graft and corruption, or at least could lead to it. They're going to go after the railroad depots, dirty places, places where immigrants hang out, places where prostitutes and pickpockets hang out, places where people congregate of different ethnicity, outsiders. Well, that. That horse is out of the barn by 1840, 1850. Railroad depots are going to be intrusions into the older life of America, even though all the statistics show that small town America, which is afraid of metropolitan America, which is railroads, crime in small town America, 1850 to 1930, is committed by locals, not the person who's passing through on the railroad, not the railroad worker who's passing through to go work on something. But they don't want to believe that. The railroad depot is the foci of deep distrust with metropolitan America. You take that forward, progressive, part of the progressive vision, part of it is let's race to the future. We love technology, we love expertise, etc. But let's make sure we have old town American values that go with us. So you're going to get this bifurcation in the landscape, politically and otherwise, where many a progressive vision is really retrograde and a vision both of eugenic purity, which rapidly dissipates once Nazi Germany becomes known. But it's there in the teens and 20s. And California is the headquarters of it, absolute headquarters of it. So you're going to get this kind of um, reverberations across the progressive landscape about the perfectibility of man, that we can do this. And they do pay attention to railroads, because they recognize that railroads can be a tool for modernity and tying together a metropolitan landscape. And where the pockets that oppose that become small town America that actually at, the, at its edges becomes, for instance, the 1920s clan that doesn't like railroads, doesn't like the radio, doesn't like good roads, doesn't like Catholics, doesn't like African Americans, yes, but also doesn't like these modern things because it, it creates mass culture, which is dangerous. Small town American values, anti-railroads, 
are what they're out. So the thread here is ask your students about nostalgia and empathy or emotive reaction to, uh, let's say, a technological innovation, and run a thread through here about how and why would you oppose this thing which we think bound the country together, sort of ended the Civil War in the 18, latter 1860s, um, was triumphantly technological, was the culmination of Manifest Destiny. How and why would you oppose that? And you know, obviously you can bring it up into today about the impact of technology in our lives. But the railroad is the you know, tried and true traditional topical feature of post-Civil War California history for good reason. It's just there are other ways to peel it back and take your students on what amounts to a ride that they'll get into. You know? And you can cut it any one of these ways. I mean, when uh, Nancy was putting up those units, I mean, the, the various ways in which those topics are sliced, the railroad thing is perfect for that. Origins, technological innovation, federal response, building it, reacting to it, reforming it, you could go to the very tail end of the First World War, nationalizing it, you're done. Then you've done 1840 to 1918 or 1920, you've covered a big swath of territory, literally and otherwise.